Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Bart Loser, and as many of you may know, this year I am our continuing education program coordinator. My job is to come up with interesting programs that are educational and fascinating. And tonight we've got probably one of my favorite topics that I always like to hear about, which is humor. I've always told people I'm not very funny, but actually I've learned how to become funny. <laughs> I don't think I'm naturally funny, but I have learned what it takes. And I've brought in three of our top speakers in our district to come in and present on how to tickle the funny bone. As you guys may know, this particular year, we have our contest season coming up with the International Speech Contest, but also this next year, we have a humorous speech contest. So people will have a chance to practice their ability to compete in the humor level. One of my favorite speakers, Darren LaCroix, who was also a world champion uh, speaker, suggests that there's treasure when we mine our failures, our flaws, and our firsts. And I thought that's an interesting technique about what, what do I talk about that could be funny? Well, that can be an area that we might uh, delve into, but that's, that's something that you certainly can find lots of treasure there. But he also says when it comes to speaking, especially a great speech, he says, great humor is not written, it's rewritten. How many of you would agree it's about rewriting it over and over and <laughs> over until you finally think, well, I think that's funny. Let me see if someone else thinks that's funny. And then I might keep it. Well, we've got three top speakers here tonight, and I'm thrilled to have them here. Our first speaker tonight will be Amy Samet, and then we'll have Jim Lowry and then Mike Carr. You're probably familiar with all three of them. If you've ever been to our district contest, you've seen them repeatedly taking over the top slots of the district and sometimes moving on, including this last year with Mike winning world champion speaker. Yay, we're thrilled to have that happen. Of course, I've heard Mike speak for, gosh, at least a dozen years, and he's always a champion, whether he'd won it at the very top or not, but you guys are all champions in my book. So I'm, I'd like to introduce our first particular speaker, and that is Amy Samet. And Amy Samet has been a Toastmaster for 22 years. She made it to district level a total of 13 times, resulting in three first place trophies. All right three second place trophies and three third place trophies. I think she just does everything in threes. We'll learn about the power of threes. But uh, she's also had four very she sad. Oh. Buddy, so she doesn't. Yep. There we go. So there's somebody. Uh, oh, there's Trixie. Let me see if I can mute. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Ah, thank you. Uh, so uh, I was just introducing Amy. In 2004, Amy took a stand-up comedy class. The final exam was performing at the Com Capital City Comedy Club at a student show. And this led to her competing in the Funniest Mom con in America contest, which was broadcast on the Nickelodeon channel and hosted by Roseanne Barr. She was a primary preliminary semifinalist and appeared on TV for seven, seven seconds. Well, that's still more than me. So, hey, uh, you, st you still have eight more seconds of your 15 seconds of fame. So. <laughs> and she is currently the vice president of education for both Laughing Matters Toastmasters. We're laughing really matters. <laughs> and Master Speakers of Austin. We're Speakers, speakers Master of Master Craft. All right. Thank you. And please help me welcome Amy Samet. Thank you so much, Bart. That was a very impressive introduction. I was thinking, wow. That's quite a lady. Who could it be? So here we are in my house, and I think I'm going to start with a question that people ask me, which is, how do you find the humor in everything? And my question right back to them is, how do you not find the humor? I used to work at the health department, and every day to get into the front door, I would have to fight my way through a group of people who were smoking right in front of the, the entry. Then I would go into the cafeteria and you had to choose before, before the line even began, you had to choose between brownies, cookies, and a milkshake. And then they were serving bacon, sausage, ham, deep fried French toast, biscuits and gravy. Again, the health department. I had a boss who said, uh, I said, could, could I talk to you for a minute? And he said to me, as long as it's with the understanding that I won't be listening. 
And I said, works for me because I'm going to be lying. Things truly happened every day, even in possibly the most insipid job that anyone could have. I work for the state checking government budget forms for errors. So once I had to call one of our grantees to tell them some important information, and when I got the woman on the phone, I said, I've been told by my supervisor that I must speak to a living, breathing human being. Can't leave a message. It has to be living, breathing human being. And she said, you're going to have to keep looking. So even at the most boring job in the world, there is humor. That's really the first thing that I want to share with you. If you wake up every day looking for humor in everything that happens in your life, you will find it. Once a presenter did an exercise where at the beginning of the presentation, she said, somewhere in this room, there are 20 $1 bills hidden. How many of you noticed those? $1 bills as you were waiting for this presentation to start. Nobody. But if I had told you at the onset, there are 20 $1 bills hidden in this room, you'd be looking and you would have found them. And then she proceeded to show where they were in fairly obvious places. So same thing with humor. Look for it. It is there every day of your life. Uh, while we're sharing quotes of famous people, Patricia Fripp said that very often she was called in to coach someone who was very talented and had a written presentation and she would be coaching them on how to breathe more life into it. And then they would go out to lunch and that same person just naturally, casually would tell the funniest story, funnier than anything that person had in their presentation. And she'd say, why aren't you using that? And they'd say, oh, why? why would I use that? That's just a story. <laughs> well, stories are terrific and stories are hilarious and your own stories can be told with more authenticity, more detail, more genuine emotion than anything else you can share that you've memorized or that you've painstakingly written. So uh, I'm even getting into some tips I hadn't planned. I, I do have three planned tips. The first one is that any humor has to have an element of surprise to it. A uh, governor went to visit one of the prisons in his jurisdiction. He was given a tour by the jail warden and he walked into a cell block and he heard the inmates yelling out numbers. One said 35 and the other inmates broke out laughing. Someone else yelled 88 and the other inmates broke out laughing. The governor said to the warden, what's going on? He said, well, they've all been here so long, they've memorized the same joke book. And all they have to do is yell out the numbers of the jokes and everyone remembers the joke and starts laughing. So the governor says, hey, can I try it? He yells out, 72, crickets. He said, what did I do wrong? The warden said, some people just can't tell a joke. See, we're not expecting that. There's gotta be a little twist that creates the humor. They say that the, the setup is when the joke is rolling down the track and the punchline is when the train derails. So all humor must have some humor element, I'm sorry, some surprise element to it or it's just not funny. Secondly, oh, here's another one. Uh, and this was from my funniest mom days. When my son turned 16, he started driving, and that meant that I had to go over the rules for car dates. I said, when you go to pick that girl up, you don't just honk your horn. You go to the front door, you come inside, you meet her father, shake his hand, and you give him your cell phone number. And then you bring that girl back over to our house so I can tell her, I'm not going to raise your baby. Surprise. Who expected that? <laughs> Second, especially in Toastmasters, your most successful type of humor is self-effacing humor. And 
Spark mentioned that at the very beginning, Darren LaCroix, LaCroix's advice of uh, talk about your failures, but self-effacing humor when you um, you put yourself down a little, you make fun of your, yourself because it's definitely going to be more of a hit than you disrespecting someone of another gender or another race. Just make fun of yourself. Uh, for example, um, one day when I was working at the state, the woman behind the counter said, how's your day going? I said, not so great. She said, oh, did you get caught in that hailstorm? I said, hailstorm? I thought people were throwing rocks at me because I'm such a bad driver. And I am a bad driver. Thank you. My third bit of advice is um, talk about things that you care about. I touched on this before. The best comedy is going to be when you talk about your dog, your family, your job, your crazy relatives, because that's something you can bring all of your true emotion to. Authenticity is very attractive in comedy when you really share yourself. In fact, uh, Lou Heckler, who's a tremendous speaking coach, he said, what people really want is for you to lift the lid of that secret chest that is your life so they can peek inside and learn your secrets. How many times have you gone to a, a speech contest and a, a complete stranger walks out on stage? Seven minutes later, after that person has delivered a dynamic, compelling speech, you feel like you know them. They have just ripped themselves open and shared everything with you. So I believe it's hugely important to talk about things you love, things that you care about, so that your audience can, can know you. I've also heard it said that every speech is an icebreaker. You're giving your, your audience an opportunity to get to know you. And, uh, and what makes you tick? You know, what, what makes your crazy brain go around? Um, honing in on that, getting in touch with it, sharing it with your audience. Uh, those are my best tips. I'll Thank be happy you. to take questions if you have yeah. I did have a question down here in the chat room. Thank you for that great presentation. Uh, here's one question, and it could be open to any of our panelists, but they say that all humor comes from tragedy, uh, or you might say tragedy plus time equals funny. What exactly do they mean by that? What does it mean to you? Tragedy plus time equals comedy. <laughs> Uh, I love that question. I think if you have a really well-trained brain, you can shorten that up. Sometimes it takes years and years to laugh at something that was painful. It's going to be funny later. But uh, if you're really good at it, even while tragedy is happening to you, you could say to yourself, uh, this is going to make a funny story. Like the most hideously embarrassing things. The first day I was at a job, and it was one of my first jobs ever. I was in my early 20s. And I was so focused on making a good impression on everybody. And the first person, uh, or, or rather, one of the first introductions that was made was the shop cat. It was a flower shop, and there was a cat at the flower shop. And the cat's name was Matilda. And then I met all the other people that worked there. And the last person I met was the bookkeeper, who had already been told, hated Yankees. And I was a Yankee. Still am, I guess, technically. So, and her name was Mildred. So I was so, so focused on making a good impression on Mildred that after meeting her, I said, it was nice to meet you, Matilda. <laughs> and uh, um, I, I mean, I knew I, I had blown it and uh, I felt absolutely horrible. But see, now it's a funny story. <laughs> Ah, I got that. Wonderful. Does anybody else want to comment on that? I have a comment. Yes, Jim. So we talk about tragedy and how years later, tragedy plus time equals humor. 25 years ago, my wife was involved in a really tragic car accident, and it involved a closed head injury. Well, here we are 25 years later, and I got to tell you, I'm the luckiest man alive because my wife can't remember anything I did wrong yesterday or any other day. She has no short-term memory. Oh, wow. 
And that you can find humor out of that kind of tragedy. It's, it's, it's great to be able to use that because I think life itself is, is difficult. And one aspect that helps us through life is being able to laugh at situations. I think one of my favorite of all time scenes in TV was in the Mary Tyler Moore show when they were all at a funeral of a clown and Mary couldn't stop laughing, which had everyone else start laughing. And at the time, I guess this was in the early 70s, the idea of laughing at a funeral was almost unheard of. Of course, I had been through the whole AIDS situation and, and said going to funerals all the time. And we learned to laugh at, fu at funerals all the time. It was all about celebrating their life and laughing. And, and that was such a wonderful way to, to deal with the grief. So, so thank you for sharing that. I did have a, a question for the three of you as well, and then we'll move on. But uh, uh, about the difference between lowbrow comedy versus highbrow comedy. Lowbrow comedy, an example might be Mel Brooks, you know, kicking someone in the crotch type of comedy versus <laughs> a highbrow comedy, which Woody Allen's comedies would be very highbrow, very intellectual, funny, but you have to think about it. Uh, which type of humor do you guys like to go for best? Whichever gets the laugh. <laughs> there you go. I say know your audience. Judge what comedy that they're going to find humorous. Mm. Great. Amy, were you going to say something? Uh, I like it all. Man, I, I mean, I, I go from the driest, smartest, wittiest comedians like uh, Todd Berry. No, 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 what am I saying? That's not right. Maybe it is. Uh, uh, okay, Hor I have a horrible memory. So, but, uh, and then Brian Regan, who's kind of goofy. Hmm. And then, oh, Gary Goldman, very smart. I, I, like, I love and appreciate all of it, hmm. the full spectrum of highbrow, lowbrow, goofy, esoteric, deadpan, physical, I love it all. And you can even take the highbrow and bring it down to the everyday. That's one thing that George Carlin was a master at. His comedy was very highbrow. He was talking about politics and life and very deep things. And yet he knew how to make everyone laugh about it. It, it was just so relatable. So he was a genius at that. So, but thank you for sharing that. And I'd like to go ahead and move on to our next speaker, Mr. Jim Lowry. And Jim is a, a distinguished Toastmaster who's been a member of Universal City Toastmasters for 11 years. When he's not toasting, he enjoys the great outdoors, as you can see with his camper in the background there. He enjoys hiking, scuba diving, and kayaking, sometimes at all, all at the same time. So please do welcome Jim Lowry. Thank you so much, Bart, for inviting me to come and talk a little bit about humor People tell me that you're a funny guy, but my father always said, 20,000 comedians out of a job and you're trying to take one of them's place. <laughs> I like to tell stories that have a humorous punch. A speech enhanced with humor is not a series of one-liners that you might hear from a stand-up comedian, although your speech may contain a joke or two, it's not a series of jokes. One aspect of adding humor to a speech is the art of embellishment. We've all seen the movies that advertise, this movie is based on a true story. After the movie, you may have even done a Google search to see how much of it was fact and how much of it was fiction. Let's face it, our lives are not always that entertaining. I'm going to tell you a story in three chapters. It's the same story, one enhanced with humor, and one without. You can tell me at the end which one you like listening to better. Chapter one. Many years ago, I took my children camping in a Texas state park. We pitched our tents. The children got the large tent, which could sleep about four people, while I got the one-man pup tent. As the sun was setting, I cooked dinner on the campfire and afterwards, we each climbed into our tents for a good night's sleep. That's the story, short and to the point. It tells exactly what happened. 
Now let's take chapter one and add a little embellishment. When my children were younger, I took them camping every summer. It was our annual dad and kids camp out. My wife's idea, actually. I would take them camping and she would take it easy. <laughs> After arriving at the campgrounds, we pitched our tents and then did all those fun things that dads do when mom's not around. You know, playing catch with rocks. Oh, that's going to leave a mark. Sword fighting with sticks. Prepare to defend yourselves. Ow. Hiking up and down steep trails till we got so lost. What do you expect from me? After all, men aren't allowed to ask for directions. <laughs> After a full day of adventure, nightfall fell. We gathered around the campfire, roasted hot dogs, marshmallows, and pretty much anything else that would burn. As the fire died down, we turned in for the evening. The kids took the big family tent while I took the tiny two-man pup tent. Sure, I know it says that on the box, but you try to get two men in that tent. <laughs> it had a broken zipper on the front flap, making it sort of a camper's doggy door, I guess. It didn't bother me that I couldn't zip up the front door. It's not like the neighbors were going to come knocking while I was taking a shower or something. I climbed into my sleeping bag and drifted off to sleep to the sound of muffled voices coming from the other tent. Move over. You're touching me. Stop touching me. I'm telling that on you. Oh my goodness, when will it ever end? There's more to this story, but I want to stop and break a few things down. First off, I don't really throw rocks at my kids. As for the muffled voices arguing with each other, that was an embellishment based on years of living with my three children and knowing that that's exactly what they would do if you stuck them together in a tent at night. More on the story, chapter two. As we left our campers, they were just settling in for the night. I was sound asleep. And about midnight, a raccoon came into the tent through the doggy door. I knew I should have fixed that zipper. Naturally, a raccoon in my tent woke me up. Yep, that's what happened. A raccoon came in my tent. Not very entertaining. Now let's embellish the story and add our second ingredient, alliteration. Alliteration is the occurrence of the same letter or sound at the beginning of closely connected words. Listen for it. It'll be easy to spot. Sometime in the middle of the night, I felt something. It touched my cheek. I instinctively jerked back. I've had a lot of practice being a jerk. Was it my imagination? Then it touched me again. I just had to wake up to find out what it was, but I couldn't. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Inside, I was shouting like two kids in the back seat on a long road trip. Stop touching me. If only I could wake up. It touched me a third time, like the cold nose of a dog. But we didn't bring a dog. Shaking my head, I wiped the sleep from my eyes, and slowly things started to come into focus. Three inches from my face, I could make out two beady eyes, a ball of fur, and more whiskers than a wino. It wasn't a dog. It was a raccoon. Bandits of the wild, those five-fingered fiends sneaking around, silently stealing your stuff. Where's my wallet? Worse yet, raccoons who aren't afraid of people sometimes carry rabies. And this one was clearly not afraid. He was in my tent, violating my personal space. I quickly sat up and backed away from that raccoon as far as the tiny tent would allow. Pulling my sleeping bag up, I formed a curtain between us. Not exactly the Great Wall of China, but he can't see me. Out of sight, out of mind. <laughs> Is he gone? 
Did he go away? Slowly, a tiny hand reached over the top of the curtain and pulled it down. The masked bandit looked me directly in the eyes like a desperate burglar. This is a stick up. Hand over the Twinkies and nobody gets hurt. What was I gonna do? Scream for help like a little girl? It's only a raccoon. A very large raccoon, but a raccoon nonetheless. Did you notice the embellishment? Just a little? How about the alliteration? Those five-fingered fiends silently stealing your stuff? I didn't point this out earlier, but I also had a variety of voices in the story. The children arguing with each other in chapter one and a talking raccoon in chapter two. Now for the third and final chapter of our story what to do with that raccoon. I had a brilliant idea on how to get rid of this raccoon. He was probably looking for something to eat. So I would get him something to eat. I left the tent, went over to the van and dug through our food stores and found something that might satisfy a raccoon. I went back into the tent and gave him a cookie thinking he would leave but he didn't. Maybe if I got another cookie, I could coax him out of the tent. So I did, and it worked. He was gone, but I didn't sleep well the rest of the night for fear that he might come back. Remember, that zipper's still broken. The raccoon's been evicted. Okay, problem solved, but not very entertaining. What if we added some little details in chapter three, version two, and my third trick, comparison, comparing one thing to another. Then I had a thought. If I give him something to eat, he will leave. I quietly crept from the tent and snuck over to my secret stash of snacks to look for something raccoonish. I found a box of Little Debbie cream-filled oatmeal cookies. Ha ha ha! Armed with plan A, I crawled back in the tent and handed the cookie to the oversized intruder who was holding my house hostage and said, okay, you have some food? Now scram. But he didn't go away. He sat down right there and ate that cookie slowly like a line at the post office. Around the edges at first, then he twisted it in half like an Oreo and licked out the cream filling. Oh, for the love of Mike, can I get you a glass of milk? I could see that plan A did not result in vacating that varmint from my vicinity. Time for plan B and another cook. This time I stayed outside the tent and lured that raccoon like tempting a teenager with a $20 bill. Come and get it. As the raccoon approached, I stepped backwards. I led him into the darkness like the Pied Piper. Only, unlike the Piper, I didn't have any pie, just a cookie. After 20 yards or so, I set that cookie on an old stump. The raccoon went for it, and I went back to my tent. You remember? The one with the broken zipper? <sighs> By this time, it was two o'clock in the morning and I was so tired, but I couldn't go back to sleep. I feared that at any moment, that rowdy rodent would return with his relatives. As I lay staring wide-eyed at the ceiling of my tent, I noticed the unmistakable scent of a skunk. Is he coming over next? Which version would you rather listen to? It all depends. Are you in a hurry and just want the facts? Or do you want to be entertained? Mr. Host. Thank you for that excellent presentation on what it takes to build a story that takes you to the top. Uh, and, and Jim, you've been there many, many times. So it's always a pleasure listening to you speak. And you do the one thing that I would say when I first started in Toastmasters that I am terrible at, which is 
really filling a story with detail. I would just give the basics. And it's like, that's not interesting. So what you've done is create a story and given people permission to embellish. And, and then it's the embellishment that really brings the story to life. These may or may not have happened, but the whole point is it draws us in and we remember that story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the other was not memorable, but and I loved your use of alliteration. So not only are you thinking what's funny, but you're also thinking of a way to present it that that is lyrical, and and that's wonderful. How, uh, you know, coming up with the the you know the varmint, you know, <laughs> the, the the various different types of alliterations you did, and that was so enlightening. And that that I've found has been the greatest lesson for me in Toastmasters is learning how to take a story that I've written and then build upon that to make it into something that's good and that's entertaining. And that often involves embellishment because my life is not that interesting. So it helps to have the ability to embellish. So thank you for that. Uh, are there any other questions out here? I see uh, Adrian had said, uh, oh yes, we, we will be putting this on in our library. So this, this recording will be in our library for resources. So we have that on the TMD 55 website, a resource library, which this is one of our many presentations there, but thank you for that, Jim. And if we don't have any other questions, I'll move on to our final speaker. Least, uh, but not, or, or what is it? Final, but not least. That's what they say. So, Mike Hakar and Mike has been a beneficiary of Toastmasters for 25 years. From his first club in Tulsa, Oklahoma, was Speak Easy Toastmasters through clubs in Corpus Christi to clubs in Austin, including Laughing Matters. Don't say it. Laughing really matters. <laughs> okay, <laughs> they're gonna say it anyways. <laughs> and Toastmasters has improved his business and volunteer communication. Mike is not naturally a funny person. I find that hard to believe, but recognized that humor makes a message more memorable, enjoyable, and it helps you to bond with your audience. It can help you win a contest or two, and Mike will walk talk today about his journey toward using more humor in every speech. Please welcome world champion of public speaking uh, currently. Um, <laughs> for, for two more minutes. <laughs> Another day. <laughs> right. Hey, well, thank you very much for inviting me. It really is true. I, I have not, I was not born a funny person. I am, don't, I am not a funny person, but I am a funny appreciator. I have sat at the, the feet of Amy Samet and watched her do her thing in Laughing Matters, Toastmasters, where Laughing Matters really matters, <laughs> and sat there and thought, how did she, okay, that's, I'm laughing so hard. How did she do that? How did she make me feel that way? And I've watched Jim in so many contests and do his thing and have laughed and stolen pieces like I stole comparison. That's a great, that's a great idea. And so I thought what I would do is share some of the things that along the way I had to try to figure out to get humor into my speeches because I could early on tell a a story that would make people lean forward, but they were always too serious. And there was that humor element that would cause me to lose a contest or even worse, not connect with an audience. So the the first thing, my first humor, humorous speech, it was a bomb. <laughs> I tried very several things about being ridiculous and w- waited too long <laughs> for laughter that wasn't coming. That was in that speakeasy Toastmasters. So I started watching people who did funny things. I, I started watching comedians. I actually asked Amy uh, Samet at one point in, at, at club, I said, how do you get material? And she, she recommended watch the moth, watch comedians, watch what they're doing. And, and I did that. I picked up my, picked that up even more and, and tried to just have a lot of that flow over me and look at what, what they were doing. It was, it was interesting. I heard Steve Martin say one time years ago, he said, I'm, the big secret is I'm always looking for the joke. So much of what I'm going to say is just, I should just say, okay, ditto what Matilda said and ditto what Jim said and just work on, work on down the line. And that was when Amy said, always being open and, and looking, I could not agree more. My 
problem is I'm that guy who says, how do you see everything is funny? But we can adjust that in our brains. We can prime ourselves to be looking for things and looking for humor in things. And I'll talk about how I, I've tried to turn that on little by little and on, and, and on a daily basis here in a little bit. One of the things that I would say is, is keeping tons of notebooks, either on a phone or actually a written paper. I heard Jeannie Robertson speak about a month ago at the National Speakers Association. And if you don't know Jeannie, she speaks to kind of a, um, I, th I think it's kind of a Southern uh, Christian, maybe audience, but Southern, Southern women, she's, I think she's, 80 some odd and is just hilarious, absolutely hilarious. So she told this story about doing a podcast and the guest canceled right at the last minute. Of course, she, she built it up. We're already laughing, talking about the way that the guest dropped out. And the end of the story was that she found this out with five minutes to spare. They were actually, it was actually live. And she just sat down, she grabbed a bunch of notebooks and she had, she did like this. So it seemed like it was a lot, sat down and said, I want y'all's help. I have all of these stories that I don't have a punchline for I, that, I, that are just setups. And she said, I started reading these setups and people came out of the woodwork giving punchlines that I had never even thought of. So I think there were two really big lessons in that for me. One is collaboration and collaborate with other funny people. Like that's why I like being around Amy Samet every time I can, because Amy just bleeds funny. <laughs> I, I say something and it, if she maybe figures out another way to say that, I would do that around Jim too, but he lives, he lives at a camper by, by the stream and I can't get there. My internet doesn't work there. So that's one. The second one is Jeannie Robertson, who has been doing comedy forever. I mean, the woman is 257 years old. She has notebooks of ideas that she has written down. And that just spoke to me that if I want to play anywhere in that park, then I need to be writing things down. Like one of the tips that I would give you in trying to figure out how to add in humor that I started doing is a lot of times you catch yourself listening to a comedian or listening to a story and you know you're coming to the point where there's going to be something funny and your brain jumps a little bit ahead and you you kind of think I know what this person's going to say I was at a, my I did my first my first what is that called stand up open mic last night and you know I actually bombed. <laughs> uh, it, 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 was, it, was, it, it was bad. It was horrible. But it, it didn't kill me. But I saw some other really good comedians. And there, were, there was one comedian that he said this thing. And I was sure that the next thing was going to be the surprise, like Amy talked about. But instead, he said the obvious thing again. And I thought, oh, I'm going to remember that because I have a story like that. And I, that could be something funny. I didn't write it down. And for the life of me, I cannot remember it now to share with you that example. But for example, I did with Amy and Jim, when Amy and Jim were going through, through theirs, when, when Amy was talking about the governor getting ready to read that joke and he read out 72, and then there's the answer. And the, the punchline is, well, some people just can't tell a joke. I thought it was going to be something like, oh, that's the only, that's the offensive joke, or that's the, that's the one about, you know, bad thing, bad things in prison. But I don't have to come up with the punchline there. If I just write it down, then I can think later of a story like that and insert my own punchline. And I've got my own joke that drafts off of one that I've just heard. And like Jim, when Jim was walking out with the with the little, I forgot it was a cream pie or a little cookie. He was walking backward. 
the, the, the vision that came in my head, I thought he was going to go into the forest. And then there was another raccoon that sat behind him and, and Jim trips, falls backward. And then both of these raccoons, he's, he's in his little white undershirt. He's in his little white underwear. His white legs are kicking up and down. He's going, no, 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 they're attacking me. While those raccoons are just going, trying to get that cream pie just so they can run off. And just the ridiculous, the ridiculous vision of that could be funny. And that brings to my second tip is so often we hear great stories like Amy's, we hear great stories like Jim's, and we don't take the next natural step to say, hmm, what is my version of that? I mean, as Jim was talking, so many of us have been camping, right? It would be so natural to remember a little funny thing that happened when we were camping. That's when we've got to pick up our notebook and just start writing or pick up our smartphone and start typing furiously to get that captured down and later can work in what's the funniest punchline. I love, Jim, that you talked about embellishment because it, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it lets us not be um, stopped by the truth police. <laughs> we can, it's comedy. We can embellish it and, and just thinking, hey, what's my version of that? I, I will tell you, when it, I've heard this last year a lot about, a lot about my speech, Blue, that, that took me to the finals, the World Championship of Public Speaking. That speech only exists because I read someone else's story and I thought, and it impacted me. I felt it in my body and I thought, huh, do I have a version of something like that? Do I have, do I have, and I, and it, and it brought back a memory of someone in my life who I'd lost. So that's a more serious version. In comedy, though, we can do that all the time, just asking, what's my version of that? And what, what, what did I think she was going to say? What, what might she have said? The other, one other thing that Jim, oh, like when Jim talked about my wallet, and I thought, <laughs> how ridiculous is it that a um, raccoon would steal his wallet? And then I thought, what if the raccoon stole his car keys? What if he, he, ushers, he ushers it out and the next thing he hears his car starting up, he ducks out and this raccoon is taken off with his car. And how ridiculous is that? But that can add a piece of humor. That's what I thought he was going to say. But then you can inculcate it into my own. What was the other one? Oh, I can't even read my writing. So, <laughs> but, but that the, the surprise, I, I would underscore for someone who is not naturally funny, surprises are easy to begin working in. Taking an audience in this direction where the next natural line would be something and all of a sudden we take a hard right turn and that's what humor is. It is the brain's response to positive surprise. Like, well, you, Amy gave you good examples or I won't. And then callbacks. Callbacks are so, so fun to do. I tried to do that a minute ago and it didn't land when I called Amy Matilda, but uh, I was trying to think, I re trying to remember something from Jim's, but, but callbacks, callbacks are that in Toastmaster meetings or in speeches. I have seen Darren LaCroix, who is just such a good hearted dude. Um, I've seen him do that so much. He's the second speaker in a keynote and he has written something down from the prior speech and just says it in the middle of his mm. speech and everyone it's that surprise factor we don't think about it and our brains go oh oh yeah <laughs> so i think that's all that's all for me um is my have i have i gone my 15 minutes i forgot to start my oh, timer you're you're just fine so thank you for that yeah you bring the one thing hey bart mm. the one thing i will say is it just it, I heard this a long time ago and I, I went on a trip to Arizona and I really tried to think on this airplane ride to Arizona and back, what could be funny about that? And that's, that's what I wanted to say at the beginning where we prime ourselves daily, just having that mantra where we walk into the grocery store and we just look around, constantly be rolling our brains complete puzzles and they answer questions. That's the way they evolved or were made. 
And if we just ask ourselves, what could be funny about that? Our brains will find all kinds of stuff everywhere. And then if we'll just write it down, we'll have a lot of material. I love what you just brought up in terms of how can we sharpen that funny bone, as you, as you, or, you, know, as you say. And a great way to sharpen it is think of your everyday experiences and see if you can break it down to what could be really funny. I mean, I can talk to people about being a vegan. I mean, you know, really trying to, to be, I'm, I'm about 95% vegan, so I'm not completely vegan. But one place where I will fail every time is when I go shopping at Costco. I was there today. They're offering those little food samples. And who can say no to that? Even when it has meat, it's free. My father taught me that's a very important lesson in life. Never pass up something free even if you're vegan. So the, the, the whole point is that you can find something funny in anything. And one of the things that I try to do when I'm writing a speech is after I've written a speech, I don't try to pressure myself into writing a funny speech. I just write a speech and then I try to break it down into pieces and say, what could be funny here? And as Jim had put in, what can I embellish here that it may not have happened, but it could have happened. Or just something goes into the ridiculous, like as you say, Mike, the, the the raccoon taking your car keys and driving off as you're saying, wait a minute, my driver's license is in there or whatever. You know, so you, can, right. you can do all sorts of crazy stuff that and have fun with it. And I was just practicing the callback, actually. But the, but the whole point is, is that uh, being being funny is many, many things. You guys presented some great ideas for approaches. There was a question I had uh, thought of a little bit earlier and I wanted to find out from you guys uh, because so much of humor is not necessarily the words you're saying, it's the delivery that's the key. That, sometimes it's the delivery that's the funny part, such as when you, you say, you know, where laughing always matters and I always go, really, does it? <laughs> you know, it's like, but it's about how you do it that, I mean, it could be insulting or it could be funny. And it's like, you want to be able to do it where you can uh, entertain. And so I wanted to find out what do you guys do to come up with the physicality, the little things you can do that takes that story to a whole new humorous level. Who would like to share? Jim. One of the things that I do is introduce new voices. That seems to be really entertaining to the audience and you know when the character has changed. It's now the little kids in the tent, or it's a raccoon saying, this is a stick up. Hand over the Twinkies and nobody gets hurt. It's a great way to do that. You know, but I also <laughs> noticed when Jim, and I, I don't remember now, when Jim was delivering um, part of the funny part of a story, his voice, his register went up and he kind of took on, it wasn't exactly that voice, Jim, that you just did for the raccoon, but it was, it was kind of, it was that, it was, it was you were delivering the, the punchline almost kind of like this. And, and, and the voice was, had a humorous tenor to it also. So I, I can't do, I don't do that. And I love it when I see people do. So I, just an observation, I, I've seen that. And Amy, you do that a lot. I, I, you use a lot of physical humor in, in your work. Where does that come from for you? I said, would you say it's more of a natural thing or do you really analyze where that, where that is? And when, when you're, oh, you're muted, by the way. That's why I'm filling this with talking until she unmutes. So Thank what do you, you do? Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, uh, well, I don't plan any of it, but if I'm talking about somebody and I'm imitating them, like I'm doing their voice or I'm doing their actions. And very often it's my dog. Like I narrate the dog all the time. And I, and I imitate the dogs. Like when, when the dog's tail is wagging, I just channel the dog when I'm talking about the dog. So it's just a, a matter of observing what you're seeing and, and, and doing it. I, I don't think I've ever planned a gesture but, oh, here's, here's a way to get in touch with your gestures. Imagine that you're telling the story, your story, to a person you're super, super comfortable talking with, where the person where, where all your animation, all your hand gestures are going to come out, and, and you're going to use your body when you tell the story, and mm -hmm. just replicate that when you're talking to a whole group. I, I hope that helps. That's, yeah, no, no yeah. We, 
we all have different skills and talents as well. And, and telling a story, if you can find a way to take your voice and work with that, like the vocal variety and such. And, and Jim, I'll get you in just a second. I, well, like I, I tell this story of getting to meet uh, one of my best friend's mothers and, and her mother is as Jewish as she comes. And, <laughs> and so I finally meet her, this woman who's bigger than life. And, uh, and so I meet her at this party and she says, so what? Letitia tells me that you're Jewish. And I said, and so I want to explain it because I'm not Jewish, <laughs> but half of my family's Jewish. I wasn't raised Jewish, so I can't claim the culture. So I'm trying to explain it to her. Well, my father's Jewish and his whole side of the family. My mother is Catholic. And she just stopped me right there and said, oh, you're not Jewish. And she walked off. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> well, that. That is how a Jewish mother would react. Like, I'm done. I'm done with you. <laughs> well, she probably had some lovely woman she was going to set me up with. And then she realized, oh, I'm not. Oh, yeah. so, uh, it's all up. You're not right. Jewish. I forget right. it. I need to find a Jewish boy. Yeah. Right. Very funny. Very so, funny. So, so true. Jim, yes. <laughs> Jim, how about for you? So one of the other things that I like to do is have my props appear out of nowhere. I was doing a, a story about camping and the next line we were going to get our hot dogs and we were going to put them on the stick. So I reached into my pocket and I pulled out a hot dog. Who keeps a hot dog in their pocket? <laughs> and that went over really well. What they didn't know, it was a real hot dog, but I had dipped it in varnish several days before so it wouldn't make a big grease stain on my shirt. So I, I like to pull props out of nowhere. I did this one speech that had a pie in the speech. And this was a District 55 contest. And I needed a pie that was lightweight. So I made one out of stuff I found at Michael's. And it was, it was almost like a Frisbee, but it looked delicious. And that one was sitting kind of on the table. Nobody knew it was there. And I just reached over, took it and brought it out. And all of a sudden, everybody wanted to know, where can I get a slice of that pie? <laughs> <laughs> and you bring up a, a great point about using props because that that can especially in in surprising people because it's, it's all about the surprise taking people in a different directions did he actually just pull out a piece of buy out of his pocket <laughs> it's, it's, those sort of shockers can be extremely funny micah asks the question he says what are some tips on enhancing an impromptu conversation with humor how do you make that funny? Like practicing your table topics and making them funny, which is a great exercise. <laughs> I, I, will, I will say I had a hard, well, it, it, came, it came, I started finding in business when it, for, first, whenever I first started trying to work on humor, look, asking what could be funny about this, but, but writing at least 15 minutes a day, writing out and writing down those things, it, it was it was amazing sitting in casual conversation that something would come up going a certain way and all it'd be just so easy to take it another another direction and people were laughing so uh, that worked for me all right how about uh, jim so if you're talking about some items and you've got an item one uh, the ball game and item two, the taxi cab and item three, the chili emporium, find something that doesn't belong with those other two. Mm -hmm. I went to the ball game. Yeah, I took a taxi cab. Well, I ran over to the chili emporium and got some heartburn. And <sighs> that kind of stuff takes the audience away from what are you, it either works or it doesn't work. One of the two. And again, you bring up the power of threes, you know, saying things that just seem to make sense. Okay, you brought up this, that fits in that category, this fits in that category, this doesn't fit. But it's, and it throws people off, and it's a great uh, approach to humor. And as Mike had said, suggested, and I would suggest this for everyone, get into the habit every day of taking simple situations and finding the humor in it. And that's how you actually sharpen that funny bone. You learn to look for the humor in life and the little things. Yes, Jim. So I have one more. I sometimes get around these college boys that use those long words and they'll bring one of those long words and then I'll go, or you could just, and say it in plain English. 
just throw it out there in plain English. And that usually breaks the ice and they either either are offended or they go, oh, I don't have to use the long college words. It's okay. <laughs> Thanks. Well, is there anything else that you guys would like to finish with or any questions out there that uh, the audience has? We have a few more minutes. I was, I hadn't heard that Darren LaCroix threes. I got, I got your failures, your first time. What was the, what was the last one? Let me see if I can remember here. It was, uh, oh, failures, flaws, and firsts. I really like And more that alliteration that Jim, Jim was talking about <laughs> that makes them memorable. And, and again, you can find different ways of humor. Like when I watch certain movies, I like different types of humor for different moments, but there's something I'm watching lately. And this is a British show uh, about plays that go wrong. And it's hysterical watching the, these people, actors trying to go through with this play and everything is going wrong and how they, not only what goes wrong, but how they react and whether or not they continue with it. Did they play with it? They had one scene where some woman was supposed to have died but her body, she was still in the room. And so they were trying to get her out of the room by pulling her up through the window. And so her body's just coming up and down, up. And it was so funny. I just couldn't stop laughing. And I guess that would be lowbrow type humor, but still that physical humor can be hysterical. So, but find humor in the everyday because laughing does make a big difference in our lives. It, it heals us. It, it helps us uh, make life a little bit lighter and more enjoyable. And certainly we love listening to great speakers who can use humor well, like Amy, Jim, and Mike. And we want to thank you for taking some time to work with us tonight and present some ideas on how we can enhance our, our speech and, and communication with more humor. So thank you for your time and thank you for everyone who joined us. Have a great night and we'll see you again soon. Thank you for the opportunity, Bart. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. Thanks. Thanks for everything. Thanks,